Okay, it is streaming. Thinking. Sure <laughs> Yay. Okay, we are live with Hannah Mary McKinnon. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeBello, and we are here for a very special Memorial Day a Mighty Mystery interview with Hannah Mary McKinnon about her brand new book, Sister Dear. Hannah, tell us about your book. Hi, Sarah. Thanks so much for having me today. This is, this is brilliant. I'm so pleased. Um, so Sister Dear, well, I'll show you the cover. This looks like a mystery, and it is. So it's a, um, a psychological suspense, we'll call it. And it's about half sisters. It's about half sisters who don't know that the other one exists until one of them finds out and she realizes that her glamorous, wealthy, um, supremely successful, revered half sister is and has everything that she could only ever dream of. And so she decides to infiltrate her sibling's life, but not tell her they're related. And of course, mayhem ensues because otherwise it wouldn't be suspense. <laughs> oh my gosh, that sounds fabulous. I'm oh, already you. hooked. Thank I'm you. so excited for your book to debut tomorrow. Tomorrow, I know, tomorrow, I'm so excited. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, and I'm absolutely just so intrigued by this as a woman with two sisters, um, who I who I absolutely adore. Um, but there's always sister relationships are always such an interesting and complex entity, um, and so it sounds like you've delved into the heart of that and then blown it up in the most dramatic way possible. Yes, I tried to anyway. Yes, exactly. And I have I have a sister, an older sister, Jolie, who is lovely, and to whom I dedicated this book because it is not based on reality <laughs> and it's important that people know that I love her dearly so that so, so she did not inspire this book at all thankfully uh, yeah I'm wondering if Jolie saw the inscription and got a little nervous did she no, start sweating? <laughs> I, no I don't think so I hope not <laughs> so tell us why this book why now well I plotted it a couple of years ago because I generally um plot probably two years ahead of the book actually coming out. And I had, yeah, roughly, <laughs> because I'm plotting something while I'm waiting for edits for another one and it's, there's, it's kind of a continuous cycle. And then I deliver it to my editor at least a year before pub date. This one I delivered to her, her first draft, my seven millionth um, in January last year, probably. So, the idea for the story came because I was listening to the radio. I was driving, probably driving one of my kids somewhere. And I heard a segment on the radio about a woman who had found a ring at a playground, a wedding ring, and she was trying to find the rightful owner. And I started wondering, well, what if she found the owner and this owner has a fantastic, wonderful life, a life she could only ever dream of. And, um, can you manage it, please? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, the doorbell just rang. That's one of my boys. The trials and tribulations of live stuff. Um, so I, I thought, well, what if she realizes that this person has a much better life than she could ever dream of mm. and gets jealous and starts stalking her? And the more I thought about it, the more I thought it would be interesting if they were related and I made them half sisters. And the ring does actually feature in the book. But it's not at a playground, but it does. I did keep that little that little gem of an idea in there. So that's that's where it came from. And why? Why now? Um, Eleanor, the protagonist, is not very self-confident. I, I think she's a different kind of protagonist. Mm. She has um, body dysmorphia issues. She has binge eating issues. And she really has a distinct lack of confidence, um, mainly because of the relationship with her mum. And very quickly, my mum's fabulous. This is also not based on history or my history at all. And I just, I fell in love with her character because she is, and uh, people have said, some early readers have said this, they, they want to grab her and give her a good shake and tell her to stop doing what she's doing or, um, that they have empathy for her, um, not that they agree with everything that she does. And I thought that was interesting to write a character where you 
you don't agree with everything they're doing, but you can't help going along for the ride. Well, hopefully most people anyway. But. You know, that's so, there's so much there that you said that I'm, that I want to delve into. Um, first of all, I think I'm just so intrigued that you, that this came, that the, that the, the sort of genesis of this idea came from seeing the, the lost ring sign on the playground. Yes. Because how many times have all of us walked by signs about missing or lost items? And the fact that that you saw that and it sparked this idea in you and then spawned this whole amazing, you know, book all from that sign is amazing to me. It's so cool. <laughs> I'll never look at one of those signs again the same because now I'll be wondering. I think that's that's what happens a lot with with my ideas. You know, that uh, Her Secret Son last year's book was something I saw on the news and I thought, oh, what if? Um, the Neighbours, that was the, the, the book two years ago. I was actually standing right here. We live on a courtyard and two houses on the courtyard went up for sale in quick succession. And I stood by the window thinking, oh, I wonder who, who would, who's going to move in? <gasps> Wouldn't it be weird if it was an ex-boyfriend? And then I thought, oh, wow, that could be a really creepy story. Um, well, less creepy, but, but more, um, uh, well, just difficult for the couple involved. So it's terrifying. <laughs> potentially, yeah. So it's those kinds of ideas, the kind of a what if, and then I, I build the story around that. I mean, not immediately, obviously. It takes takes time and effort and, and wondering and seeing whether it's actually, whether the idea actually has any legs. Mm. Um, but with Sister Deer, it turned into having quite long ones. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's so interesting. And the other thing that I wanted to go back to that you said is that, the feedback has been that they're um that people want to grab her and shake her um and i think this i just love that we're seeing more nuanced complicated layered portrayals of women right now yes um, agreed. because i think that just is so important and so necessary um and and so i love that you did that was it hard for you to hold yourself back from just making her do the right thing all the time? <laughs> no, hard, no. Um, I know, I tried I tried very hard to make my characters feel real. And I interview them, I know that sounds weird, but I interview my characters, I, I have three pages of questions that the answers, most of them never make it into the book, but they become very real to me. And I know that when I finished Sister Day and I, it was the, the copy edits were done and, and, and she was, she was, it was done. I remember my husband saying, I'm glad, I'm glad you finished with that. I'm glad you're done with that book now because, because you've been carrying her around with you. And I had, because I felt bad for her. Um, and I felt bad for what I put her through, which is so weird because she's not real, but she felt real to me. And it was really important that I had someone who was human, who was complex, who has these, these issues. Um, and, and not all of them get resolved, you know? It's not the picture perfect, oh, everything's happy. Because, okay, it's not a rom-com either. Um, but I, I wanted to have a story where, where the, the heroine wasn't an obvious heroine, I guess, and where she was really, really deeply flawed. Well, she didn't always make the right choices and it was it was fun to write i have to say it really was i really enjoyed writing this one. Oh, i'm so excited and i just love hearing that because i think we you know if you if we if if women only see you know perfect women portrayed it only makes the rest of us feel really bad yes <laughs> so it's yes. you know we have been saying we've been seeing deeply flawed male portrayals for generations now and yes. I think it's high time that we see some some of these you know multi-layered women so that's amazing I'm so excited to read this book it comes out tomorrow we're all so excited um so tell us about your writing your writing practice your writing process well it's changed over the years um, um so I handed next year's book in already um back in January and the more I write the more I plot so I always plotted a little so you know we generally say you have the plotters and, and the pantsers yes. those who who don't plot at all and fly by the seat of their pants um and then the planters in the middle so I guess I was I was always a bit of a planter but I found okay. that it, but now that I've I'm 
I'm on deadline, I'm writing a book a year. I can't, I don't find, and I know authors who, who deliver a book a year and don't plot at all. And, and I just, I bow down to them because that's incredible. Yeah. I can't do that. I need to know, no, I was gonna say, I need to know where I'm going. I need to think I know where I'm going. So I plot a book out from, from beginning to end. I'll start off with the, the very the very big, the major plot points. Generally, where's the character at the beginning? Where are they at the end? And then I'll break it down into little stepping stones, generally about 30 of them. And it's quite scientific and people laugh when they hear this. So I'll start with the beginning and end, and then I'll expand those plot points into about 30. And each plot point, or it's not even seen, each, each chapter, let's call it a chapter, I'll break it down in more into even uh, more plot points or scenes. And each of those 30 chapters has to be about 2000 words when I write my quick and dirty skeleton draft. Okay. 2000 words because I write up. So there are people who write 120,000 words and then cut it down to 80 or 90. I don't do that. I do 2000 words per post, per, per, I was gonna say post it, but per, um, chapter, if you like, minimum, that gives me 60,000 words. And I know that through my editing and layering and writing descriptions and adding more emotion, because the first skeleton draft, no one, that's not even a first draft. It's, it's bare bones. It's, it's just awful. Um, but I know that by the end of it, I'll be at about 90, 95,000 words. And I don't know why it works, but it just does. So this plot, this, this, heavy plotting method gives me a sense of where I'm going. Whether I actually end up where I thought I was gonna be depends. So for Sister Dear, I did. Uh, the ending was exactly the way I'd imagined it. A touch more evil, perhaps, because um, I flipped one of the plot points and, and that worked better in my opinion. But with my other books, with The Neighbours, completely different ending, with Her Secret Son, different too because I couldn't figure out who was going to die <laughs> so, <laughs> so I spent a lot of time in the weeds figuring out who I was going to kill off and who was going to do it and I thought I had it plotted out and it wasn't working but Sister Dear just seemed to come together and I, I think that's maybe I want to say it's more because of experience but I don't think so because the book I handed in in January for next year um, the edits, the structural edits were quite heavy because the plot wasn't working the way I, I wanted it to. Um, so it's maybe it was the story, maybe it was the characters, I don't know, it just seemed to click with this one. It's actually the fastest one I've ever written. I think Sister D I wrote in, um, and I don't, I, I, this uh, not my skeleton draft, that's generally about six weeks, but my draft that I delivered to my editor was about four and a half months. Minus the plotting time, I mean, or plus the plotting time, that would be in addition to. But I wrote the thing in about four and a half months, and I don't think that will ever happen again. I, wow. I don't know why, but it just, it just, it just worked. So, yeah, let's I see. Down. Well, the jury's out. We'll see once the reviews are in, right? <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. Okay, what I think I'm so fascinated by are, I mean, several things is that. Um, so most of the people that we talk to are either very passionate plotters or pantsers, and they never they never mix. So I actually hadn't heard the term planter before. That's brand new to me. Yeah, <laughs> and it's so interesting to me that that's how you write with these questions, these letters, these interviews to your fictional characters, but yet you have this very rigorous, very scientific plotting process yes right down to the word count I mean I'm just I'm so interested yes it's it's, so it's fascinating. I think it's because um I'm a highly organized person um mm -hmm. which is both a blessing and a curse just ask my husband and my kids um <laughs> don't didn't you have an assignment oh she remembered um <laughs> you know that kind of thing so it, it it I think in a way it's a it's a safety net for me to mm -hmm. to think the story through and, and uh, as I mentioned, have, have the impression that I'm in control. But then when I write the character, sometimes they just, they, they go off in a different, my subconscious obviously, but they go off in a different direction and, and, and generally I follow them because they seem to know better. So yeah, I'm a, definitely a heavy 
a heavy plotter. And interviewing characters is actually, it's weird, but it's fun because it makes you really think about who they are and it makes sure that they're not all the same because you've really thought about, and there are silly questions in there like, um, has your character seen a ghost? Well, that's I'm not writing a ghost story, but do they believe in ghosts? Have they ever seen one? Uh, what's their favorite joke? You know, those kind of, and, and that's never gonna get into the book. Mm -hmm. But the point is that it makes sure that they're different, that I've really thought about them being different, having different backgrounds, having different just emotions and reactions to stuff. So they become, they become very, very, very real to me, yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. Well, wow. and are the questions the same for each character and for each book? Is it always, yes, you believe in ghosts, the yes. same questions? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It's about three pages of them. There's quite a lot of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you developed this personality, get to know you sort of process for you and these characters. Well, I wouldn't say I developed it. It was something I found on the internet and I mixed it in with, with um, my own questions and courses I'd taken. And so it's a, an amalgamation of things. And one of the, well, I think four of my favorite questions are, where is this character at the beginning? Where are they at the end? Because that gives you a nice arc. You're already thinking about that. And then the, the other one is, why are you interested in this character? And why should I be? So you're thinking about yourself and your reader. So, yeah, I it's, love this. I love yeah. this. This is such a great insight and such a great educational tutorial for all of um, the writers in our audience, of which we have many. So this is, I think, this is absolutely fascinating. And I'm actually wondering because I know that you used to work in HR before your thrilling career, your new That's career right. as a thriller writer. I'm wondering if you know if some of this has has helped you to become this. It has informed and your writing in terms of, Probably. you know, personality tests and getting to know someone and if they're right for a job. And I wonder yes, if there's, it, there's some... it probably has because I used to do lots of appraisals and I and I built appraisals, put them together. And, and so, it, yeah, I think I think that background has definitely had an influence on it. Absolutely. Yeah. I never really thought of it, but it, it has. Yes. Yeah, it's the interest in humans and what makes someone that way, right? Yes, what yes, you exactly. Spent your whole career learning about, and that richly informs your writing. And it's so interesting because I always think to myself, you know, having made a large career transition myself from the corporate world and now to writing as well. And I think it's always tempting, you know, a lot of people don't find writing until later, either yes. for a lot of different reasons, all of which are valid. And sometimes it's for very real reasons and financial reasons and family reasons or you know confidence reasons and all of these reasons are valid um but i always try to tell myself and others that no time is wasted that that each thing has brought you something that will serve you in in this next chapter so to speak of our lives and and here's proof that it that it did and this makes you a better writer and a more informed writer because you're bringing those skills here I, I saw uh, very often I see these um, tweets and people are saying I'm I'm 30 and I, or I'm 25 or whatever and I haven't been published yet and I'm thinking my god I didn't even think about getting published that wasn't that wasn't ever on my horizon at all until well until I started writing uh, fiction of uh, fiction because I wrote a lot for work but newsletters and company policies and um, appraisals don't really count so my, my first book was published in 2016. I was, I was 45. So, uh, you know, if you're 25 or if you're uh, you know, 55 or 65, who cares? There was a, a lady um, recently, her first novel was published, I think she was 89. I think, it, I, oh, Sandel Morris, The Spiral Shell. I think she was, was she 80, 83 or 85? We just, we just supported her here on A Mighty Blaze. She's one amazing. of our these authors. And here she is, yes, a vibrant, beautiful, energetic woman in her 80s coming out with her first book. It was so inspiring mm -hmm. and so reassuring, I think, for all of us who are still trying to get, you know, to that next chapter in our lives. And yes, absolutely. Yeah. Same thing. I also, at 25, was not even, did not even think about writing. I mean, I, I dreamt of writing a book, but it didn't feel possible for me at, in that, at that stage of my life. Exactly. Um, and, you know, and here I'm turning 43 and still working on my second book. So 
it's a process and it takes as long as it takes. But I think, I just think it's so important to remember that all of these skills and experiences that we're, you know, going through are, are never wasted because look how it's enriching your writing and helping you to create these multi-layered fascinating characters. Yes, absolutely. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, so Hannah, do you prefer Hannah Mary or Hannah? Oh, only my mom calls me Hannah Mary when I'm in trouble. <laughs> so we, we'll we, avoid that. <laughs> You're not in trouble. No, go, oh, good. Uh, no, we, so I, my first book came out initially as Hannah McKinnon, but there's actually another author called Hannah McKinnon, who's lovely. And she has a, a new book coming out on June the 2nd called The View From Here. And she's amazing. She writes these, these family I don't want to call them dramas because that sounds too heavy, but they're, they're absolutely beautiful, wonderful books. I've read them all. She's fantastic. She's, she's American blonde and has straight hair, which I am not and do not obviously. And she's fantastic. Um, so we had added the Mary because people kept confusing us. They'd see our books and go, Oh, you have another book out. No, no, that's not mine. So that's why that's, that is actually my middle name. It is, that is my, my, my full name, but I just go by Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. I have a sister named Hannah. Adore her. One of my best friends in the whole world. Um, so Hannah, tell us what is one book that has changed your life? My wow. Okay. Ooh. Um, I'm going to have to go with Jennifer Hillier's Creep, and I always mention this one. So Je I, I found this book. I was at the library, waiting for one of my boys, and I spotted it on a shelf. And the cover was this really creepy. Well, first of all, it says creep on it, so it's bad to be creepy. <laughs> but I think it had this, I think it has a set of handcuffs. It was, I have it just on my shelf, actually. And it was just, I don't know, it it just pulled me in. So I picked it up, I read the, the cover, and I thought, okay, I'm taking this home. And I hadn't actually read thrillers for a long time. I used to read them a lot when when I was in my in my teens and my early 20s. And then um, somebody very close to me died in very tragic circumstances and I just stopped reading. I couldn't, I just, I needed, I needed the rom-coms, I needed the chick lit, I needed the light stuff. So this was when I was writing The Neighbours and I already knew it felt darker. It felt, it wasn't like my first one, my rom-com. There was stuff, bad stuff was starting to happen and and I thought, oh, can I, you know, do I want to, should I go over to the dark side, whatever. And I read Jennifer's book and I, I thought, that's it. I want to write dark stuff. I'm, that's it. That's what I remember reading or what I remember lo loving to read. So that was the book that propelled me over to the dark side. Now, funny story, I was at Bouticon, the Murder Mystery Readers and Writers Convention in Toronto, it was held in 2018. And I came down an elevator and I saw Jennifer Hillier and I gasped and I fangled and she was chatting, I think with her agent and I interrupted them very rudely. I said, I'm so sorry, but you know, I read your book and it, you took me over to the dark side and I just love what you do. And she actually now, she used to live in Seattle. She now lives in the same town. We live in the same town. We go and have brunch and breakfast and we've become good friends. Uh, and I have all her books, of course. And her latest one, Little Secrets, is fantastic. So it's, so, it's just so funny. And it was, it was her book that gave me this big shove that gave me, not permission, but that's almost what it felt like that I was allowed to cross over to the dark side, that I was, that I was ready, so to speak. Um, so it would, I'm would, going to have to go with Jennifer Hillier's Creep. I love that. Wow. Because I think so many times I ask that question and it'll be a very, you know, sort of classic book or, but it's, it hasn't had that very personal, very hands-on touch. So yeah. I think that's it's such a special story because it really has absolutely changed your life. In, yes. So many ways. And this has become a dear friend of ours. I love that. Yes. I absolutely yes. love that um so so she was one of my other questions is a writer you're dying to meet but she was a writer you were dying to meet and now has become a dear friend of yours is there another writer that you're dying to meet yes so um I have read and I have all of Lisa Jewell's books mm -hmm. and I have a long-standing love affair with her books I picked up her first one Ralph's party at an airport and and just gobbled it up and then that was it every every year I'd get her latest one 
and she was actually in the Toronto area in February and we connected on social media and I was all set to go to the event and I'd asked her I said look uh, will you sign my books well your books you know but my books and she said yes of course and I said well how many can I bring she said well bring all of them I said but I have them all she said that's okay bring them all so I had them in a bag and I was ready to go and there was a snowstorm a really bad snowstorm and it was at least an hour's drive and there were travel warnings of travel advisors mm. don't travel unless really necessary and, and I, I did I ended up not going and I wish I'd gone I really do so I'm, I'm hoping that she'll be back in the area again at some point because I'd absolutely love to meet her that would be great I have a feeling that's going to happen and 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 I and maybe she'll become your, your next new best friend <laughs> <laughs> I've, I have a feeling great things are coming <laughs> put a good put a good word in for me then will you <laughs> I shall <laughs> yes, absolutely. <Thank> you. <laughs> Hannah, what's your favorite scene from your new book, Sister Dear? The end. The end because it was it was so deliciously evil to write. And I remember actually cackling like this old witch, thinking, <laughs> this is just, this is just, I, can I write this? Can I, can I, yes, yes, I can. And so I did. So it would have to be, it would have to be the end. That was my absolute favorite. And not just because it was the end, you know, <gasps> Phew, the book's done because it wasn't because then it goes through <laughs> edits, obviously. But yeah, it would, it would be the ending. Definitely. Ooh. Well, now I can't wait to, to read the <laughs> end. Um, what is the best writing advice you've ever received and the worst? The worst. Okay. So the best writing advice I've ever received is if you're stuck, even if you plot, but you're stuck on a scene, say you're stuck on chapter eight, but you know what happens in chapter 12, or maybe at the end, write that. Just skip ahead, because a book does not have to be written, the chapters don't have to be written in order. You can write them in whichever order you want, and then put them in the order that feels right. Mm. And that was quite eye-opening to me. I'd never really thought of that. Maybe because I'm so structured, you know, I thought, oh, I have to write from chapter one to... 30 or however many um but you but you don't um if you don't know what's going to happen but you figured out the ending go and write that because that will then on un, potentially unblock whatever's not working for you in one particular scene so so that was vital to me uh oh i just lost my light um that is so interesting because i'm also a very structured writer and i also like must go through every single you know thing in order and actually, um, my best friend Amy is uh, is less structured, and she just is like, if it's not working, leave it. And her theory is, it all has to get done in the end, so just do it. And that was also <laughs> sort of mind blowing for me, you know, that things do not have to be done in this. Yes, yes, they do, they, they really don't. It, and mm -hmm. it may be even be easier for for writers if they're not, you know. Um, and the worst writing advice I think I ever received, but I will put a caveat on that is write what you know. So uh, I write about murder, um, you know, people are dying and, and <laughs> adultery and all these kinds of things. So I disagree with the write what you know because I know about IT recruitment. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm sure I could make a good story about it somehow, but you know, um, th there would only ever be one book. But the caveat I would put on that is if if you're writing, um, let's say a sensitive area, sensitive topic, whether it's something to do with race or experience or whatever, then make sure you do your research. Make sure you have sensitivity readers. Make sure that you do your homework. But in terms of me writing about murder, which I know nothing about, um, that's what I haven't imagined know nothing about I have no experience of it I've learned a lot with my dubious search history on my computer <laughs> that has me on several watch lists I'm sure um I'm sure. but that yeah the, the the right what you know well no use your imagination that's that's what it's there for oh I love that oh my gosh this is so great this is so great I love everything that we're talking about it really resonates um, I feel like I could talk to you forever, but I feel like we're running out of time. So let's get into the, let's do a few lightning round questions and sure. then we will wrap up. So let's get to know Hannah a little more. Hannah, uh -oh. do you prefer chocolate or vanilla? Oh, chocolate. Definitely. Hands down. Every time. Same. Are you a cat or a cat or a dog person? Dog. 
insane. What is your weirdest writing ritual? Tell us your weird. Uh, I have to have a tidy desk. Okay. If I have a cl cluttered desk, cluttered mind, uh, I, I need it. I need it to be clear. I'll <laughs> clear my desk and then, and then I know it's weird. It's, it's, it's something about it. Yeah. So that that would be my quirk. Well, considering what you write about, I actually had braced myself for something weirder. <laughs> <laughs> That's not that weird. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> And are you a morning, morning, do you rise with the sun and rush to your desk and just, you know, or are you sort of a late night up by the moonlight kind of writer? Depends on the phase I'm in um, of the book. So if I'm, if I'm writing the skeleton draft, the quick and dirty, I'll get up in the morning. I'll, I try and work out first thing in the morning because otherwise I know I won't bother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I'll, and then I'll write. But if I'm editing, then I'll I'll work late into the night. There's something really satisfying about creating and editing and finishing and really making progress, putting meat on those on those um, book bones, if you like, when everyone else is asleep and the house is completely quiet. So it, it depends on the, the phase that I'm in with a particular book. I love that. Yeah, I and, it, and you're right. It does it does sort of flow with the with the. Although I'm always a night person, but I can see oh, how it would be. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, okay, perfect. Is there anything that you want to share with us before that you wish I'd asked or that you just have a party thought you'd like to share with us? Um, well, I love joining book clubs. I love joining book clubs online. So if people choose one of my books as their, as their book club, I'm always, always happy to Skype in or FaceTime or Zoom or whatever it might be. Um, all you need to do is ask. So you'll, people will find me on hannahmarymckinnon.com with all the social links and so forth. Perfect. And we have posted our production on, the, um, my husband stepping as the production has posted all the links to your website, to bookshop.org, because here at A Mighty Blaze, we believe in supporting indies. So bookshop.org supports indie bookstores. You can get Hannah's book there first thing tomorrow. It's on sale. Yay! So what's better than saving money, supporting indies, reading Hannah's fabulous new psychological thriller sister dear it's all there the links are right below links to her website her twitter her instagram bookshop.org check out the book and it goes live tomorrow we can't wait um hannah thank you so much for joining us here at a mighty blaze and we will be promoting your book all day tomorrow congratulations you. on your launch and we look forward to keeping in touch thank you sir thank you very very much this has been so much fun thank you yeah, we've loved having you thank you hannah okay perfect now I'm just going to